He is the winningest pro in the history of the sport. 29 tournament wins, eight-time Angler of the Year, four-time Bassmaster Classic champion from Kalamazoo, Michigan, KVD, Kevin Van Dam, joins me this week on... I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Another Wednesday, and here we go, friends. Welcome one, welcome all, friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. So right now, as you watch this, I'm in the middle of two back-to-back events, obviously Lake Champlain, and right now I'm um, on my way to Thousand Islands, Clayton, New York, for the final event of the season. I recorded this before I even left home because I knew I couldn't get you one otherwise. But I got you a good one. I got you the one with the one. KVD, Kevin Van Dam, recently fished his final tournament. Well, not his final tournament. He's got a couple next year, but we'll talk about that. But uh, what that dude has done for this sport is unfathomable. Um, It's incredible. It really, truly is incredible. Um, I've said this a few times. Weirdly enough, I have a hard time putting into words what he's done for the sport because it's, it is that much. Um, but he's just a great dude. And I'll, tell, I'll prove to you how great a dude he is because I forgot about this show. I forgot that I would not be home in between the two events. And we weren't going to have a show. And literally, I gave him, you know, an hour's notice, said, hey, can you help me out of a bind? I mean, I only called the biggest name in the freaking industry to help me. And he was there for, for not just for me, but for all of us, which is another reason that KVD is a friend of the show. And you're going to see him a lot more here in the future, I imagine. Um, you're going to see a lot of cool stuff out of Kevin Van Dam in, in the future, because here's the thing about Kevin Van Dam. He is the greatest tournament angler of all time. The most accomplished by far, by far the most accomplished tournament pro of all time. But he didn't get there by accident. He got there by literally his incredible work ethic. So here's where I'm excited. I can't wait to see what's next for KVD. I can't wait to see. um, I mean, he's got plans. Trust me, he's got plans. He's always got plans. I mean, he's Kevin Van Dam. And uh, there's going to be some exciting stuff coming down the road from kvd and i look forward to seeing it this week we talk about all sorts of stuff i mean we literally talk about the sport talk about what it felt like to go through that um i just we we talk about everything really we're all over the board and i thank him for that i I hope that this all goes smooth because i'll be honest we just finished recording it and we did have some wi-fi issues i don't know why maybe there was a storm in the area or whatever but we did have some Wi-Fi issues, so we're going to try to cut up. So if you do see a couple of, uh, we, we, we're fixing that. We're tr- we, or it is, has been fixed by the time you see it. But um, I think it'll all get put together smoothly. If not, I apologize. And there very re- almost was not a podcast this week. But thanks to the greatest to ever play the game. We got a podcast this week. And congratulations to whoever won Lake Champlain. We will talk about all that next week. We will talk about our Dakota Lithium Rookie of the Year race. We will talk about our Progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year race. I mean, it's all coming down to this final event. Champlain was fun, I assume. I mean, it generally always is. Um So lots of stuff to talk about Champlain, lots of stuff to talk about Thousand Islands, but that's all next week. This week, we talk to the greatest to ever play the game and one of my best friends on this entire planet, KVD, Kevin Van Dam. KVD, you may be my first... I mean, I've had friends who retire from hockey and stuff like that, but like for us working stiffs, which I kind of consider pro anglers, I mean, you work just as many hours as you would in a full time. You may be my first friend that's retired. Retired from tournaments maybe, but yeah, it's weird to be honest with you. Um, This whole season has gone by like super fast. You know, when I announced my retirement, I wasn't sure how it'd go, you know, you want to win. And I mean, it seems like every single tournament, um, it just, it just flew by, but yeah, I mean, 
after last week, there's definitely a short sense of relief, um, excitement, uh, just, I don't know. I, I was definitely pretty anxious over it. The tournament, you know, once I get out in the water fishing, it all goes away. I go back into, you know, whatever you want to call it, it tournament mode, and, but off the water and in prepping and things like that, it, it, it all, it all came to a head there pretty, pretty quick there. So it's, uh, I, I'm still really good with my decision, but there's no doubt that last week was, it was pretty emotional. Yeah. I mean, it had to be, I, I would just imagine, I mean, I called you kind of the week before and we had a quick chat and I was like, is it feel weird? Just cause I mean, you to announce it's one thing, but then you, you mean you announced it and got right back into doing your job competing, but to be like, launching for the last time and going to i mean what were the moments i mean leading up to it that week must have been strange it was and you know i was kind of okay but every time i turned around um you know somebody was asking me that question and thinking about it you know we filmed um you know king of bass kbd's yeah. last ride all season long um and that was the last one. And I mean, those guys are, they're with me, uh, the whole, you know, pretty much all the time. So yeah, they're bringing it to the forefront all the time. You know, Brandon is, he's really good at it and he kind of knows the moment and he knows me really well. I mean, we've known each other for a while. We've done a lot, um, you know, for strike King and lose film and protein journals and, you know, next levels and Kings of Bass in the past. And so, yeah, he's always, trying to pull the juice out of me, you know, and, and then last week it was, it all, it all kind of, uh, rolled out into, you know, at once. And it was, um, I, to be honest, St. Clair was the event that I was the most worried about. I, I put a lot of pressure on myself to win there. I, I felt like looking at the schedule, that's the one I had an asterisk by all season long to think that, Hey, this is, that's my best shot. You know, you, yeah. I, 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 trust me, I want to win uh, as bad as anybody. And I know how hard it is and what you, what it takes to do that. And I did, I did the prep work. I put my, you know, my time in, but based on, you know, the rules that we live by, I mean, you, no information rule or anything like that in Saginaw Bay, because I hadn't been there in 30 years. So, you know, I went there earlier this summer, but uh, other than that, though, I mean, as far as the the tackle prep and the, the doing the research and you know all the things that you have to do to be a pro angler i i think and compete at the top level i put into all season long and it just didn't pan out you know i've had some ups and downs and you know solid events but just you know close in a lot of cases a lot closer than it looked on paper after the you know the tournament was over but you know that's just the nature of competitive fishing now it's the difference between 25th and, and having a chance to win being in the championship round, um, especially with our format where you cut, you know, and, and then restart into the knockout round and just, it's a two day shootout again. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of strategy involved. Um, and I fished under the reason or anything like that, but St. Clair was the one that I had on my radar. And what really hurt me there more than anything was that Canada didn't open until the first competition day. Yeah. And, you know, everybody else is out there, you know, in the rest of the world is fishing for walleye in Canada, right? <laughs> in the closed season or pike or muskie. But, it, you know, in our rules, we can't do that. So we could have our boat in Canada. So I went over there and idled around. And I can tell you, after a couple hours of, of graphing around, I was super bored. <laughs> like, I, mean, I can't, I can't do this. And to go into a tournament cold turkey, not really knowing what's there or not there into an area as much as I know, as big as St. Clair is, yeah, it was it was hard. So uh, that was a challenge. And you know, Jordan Lee ended up. I mean, he obviously you know in a Mayfly hatch or something, and he he found the right area and he shut down the right area and, and he never slowed down after that. I mean, he caught him every single day. And I had a good tournament there, but just not. I just missed the areas that were loaded with five pounders and and i i was pretty down and dejected after that I, I really was because saginaw bay i haven't been to in 30 years yeah it's three hours away but i mean i filmed a spinnerbait video for bass pro shops in 1992 and in, and until 
um, like the week before the St. Clair event, I went over there and, and got to fish two days. Of course, both days I was there, you know, the wind ended up blowing pretty hard and it's hard to really learn much, uh, you know, about it. And, you know, it's a month and a half before the event. So it's, it's really challenging to, uh, you know, know anything about it. So I didn't think I had much of a chance, you know, to, to opportunity. And, you know, I, I put a ton of pressure on myself uh, to, to compete at the highest level in every event. And, you know, all season long, you know, we're at, we started out at the Kissimmee chain and I'm like, man, this is the last time that I'm going to compete in a tournament here at Toho and Kissimmee, you know, and, and I let that one slip away. And I, we go to Lake Murray and it's like, man, this is awesome. The fishing was incredible. And I was around the right kind of fish and all that. And I just didn't make it happen, you know, to, to make the championship round. And it's like, man, this is the last time. I mean, the, the finality of it all really yeah. hits, hits you at the end of each event. And that just builds and builds, you know, it just keeps going as the year goes on. And, uh, you know, when it came down to this last event, I was, uh, you know, my, let's put it this way. My confidence level was, was not super high. You know, like I said, the King of Bass guys, they were following me for it. So they follow you to your first practice day and, uh, brands in the boat with me. And I mean, we're not getting really any bites. You know, Band of Bees, and he's out there running camera boat. And Neil and I, we've done a lot of shows. He 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 probably knows Saginaw Bay pretty good. And I, and it, you know, he stayed till probably one thirty or two. And I mean, I just wasn't getting hardly any bites, catching a few small largemouth. Hadn't seen a smallmouth. And I I think he he looked back and said, "Man, you're screwed." You know, he just knew that <laughs> I wasn't finding anything. I mean, and we went out to. Uh, the charity islands and all the north stuff where the rock is at for smallmouth. And I looked at a lot of stuff and great day, calm, you could see. Uh, and you know how clear it is. It's just like Thousand Islands or, uh, you know, other areas of the Great Lakes where it's crystal clear. And I mean, if they're there, not only are you going to catch them, but you're going to see them too. You know, smallmouth tell you where they're at. And late in the day, you know, the wind picked up and later in the day, I just kept going through my progression, just following around the base huge. And, and I got into a little area and I caught one about two and a half, three pounds, small mile. And the very next cast, I got another bite and I moved up about 50 yards and threw out there and caught a four pounder. And there was a couple with it. And I'm like, oh boy, we uh, might be onto something here. And I didn't know how many was there or not, but I mean, it's literally all I had. It's the only smallmouth bites I had. And, you know, from there, I was able to, you know, I started the tournament there and just, just ripped them right out the gate. And, you know, I throw out there, catch a three and a half or four pounder, and there's 10 trying to take the bait out of its mouth when I'm reeling it in. And, you know, I knew then, if, you know, I had, I'd have a chance if I could manage that, that area for the tournament. And, in the end, we came close. It was almost a fairy tale, but uh, you know that last day, the wind switched around and blew blew real hard into there and muddied it up. And I mean, they just just like smallmouth do, they left. And you know, I tried to uh, adjust and go catch you know catch largemouth, and I caught a solid bag, but but uh, in the end, you know, it just wasn't enough. Just one of those deals. Mother Nature got her revenge. Yeah. And after a career full of telling everybody the wind is your friend, you would think of all <laughs> things, the wind would be your friend on the final day. Does that burn? Does that second burn a little more? Because I mean, the entire fit, like you don't know this and I, maybe you have some kind of idea, but as a friend, I, I think I, I want to tell you, dude, like the entire fishing world stopped. Like every, it doesn't, if you, the amount of texts and things that, I mean, obviously we don't work in the same factory anymore. So we get, we've been through this. The amount of texts that I was getting was insane. The amount of people that just like were, wow. I mean, this is like watching Tom Brady finish after winning the Super Bowl. You know what I mean? Like to have this opportunity. <clears throat> Does that second burn a little more or is there some just like, like how do you justify yeah. that in your head? You know, um, as as that day was transpiring uh that on sunday you know i went to that area started out and i fished real thorough through there for an hour and never had a sniff never saw one never had a bite and i knew right then that you know 
it, I wasn't going to be able to make it happen that way. But I thought it'd be pretty tough for the other guys too. So I started, you know, I, I made my move pretty quick to, and I started catching a few and started, you know, getting, getting back up on the score tracker. And, and I actually took the lead back again. And, you know, into the second period, that's, that's when Becker started uh, catching some big ones. Obviously it, you know, found something. And I knew then that it was, you know, I would have to make that adjustment back and, and just go all in and try to catch the smallmouth. I, I just wasn't going to be able to catch a big enough sack of largemouth. They're, they're just not big there. There's a lot of them, but they're not big. It's a cool, cool fishery, but uh, I knew my only chance was that. So that being said, um, when it was all said and over, I mean, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't mad. I wasn't, uh, you know, ticked off. I wasn't disappointed. I wasn't honestly, after all the pressure that I put on myself to, to win and, you know, you go, what, what better deal you're leading going into the championship day on your last event of your career in your home state of Michigan, I'm going to have, you know, a ton of my family going to be there and friends and stuff like that. I mean, that's the, that's the storybook ending that you, yeah. you want, you know, that you, and everybody's like, Oh, you know, you're such a closer. Well, you know, yeah. When you, when you have options, but I mean, it just, the, the conditions, it just took it away from me. So when, when the buzzer went off at the end of the day and, you know, I made the run back in, you know, I've, I had my posters on, you know, those new King tides, and I've got my camera guy and my uh, official there. And I mean, I literally, and it was rough. Um, I cried going back in tears of how special it was. And I, I knew the magnitude of what I, uh, had, the opportunity that I had and what I've accomplished. And, you know, one tournament doesn't define you. One season doesn't define you. Um, you know, you look at your, I look at my whole body of work. I'm, I'm, super proud of of the accomplishments that I've had it's it's not about the money or the trophies or the accolades or anything like that but I just what what means more to me today than anything is the comments and all the well wishes from my competitors from over the years and a lot of the the my sponsors and then a lot of companies that are competitive sponsors too of just yeah. you know what the things they've said of of you know, what I mean to the sport and, you know, to, uh, how I competed certain standards, you know, when I started, you got to remember it was the, uh, Larry Nixon, Rick Clun, Danny Brower, Tommy Martin, uh, Guido Hibden, you know, we fished invitationals in the early bass days where you're pro on pro. Yeah. And a lot of how you respected another angler or how you fished around another angler in areas that was taught when you were, boat you know both standing on the front deck of a boat today you know it's not that way anymore and uh and there's a lot of things different but you saw if you watched any of the final day i mean you saw randall tharp pull up to me and say hey i came in here yesterday caught my two biggest ones late and i've been trying to save this area he said i'm sure you've been fishing it all week i knew when you uh when we headed out this morning and we were headed in the same direction that you were he said i just knew you were here uh, and the opportunity to give it to you for the first period but then you know i'm coming back you know on the knockout round day this happened and uh you know that right there is you know the ultimate show of of class respect and integrity so it's always how, somebody right <laughs> you know and how different is i mean early 90s you started like you said it was larry nixon roland martin the list goes on and on yeah. How different is the sport today than when you started? It's a, it's a ton different. Um, you know, back then you, at the end of the tournament competition day, you might talk to a, a couple of your friends at the hotel, things like that. I mean, there was no bassmaster.com even or anything. Now these guys are scouring the internet. They're looking to see what's going on, who, who trying to get a clue. Um, it's real easy for them for guys to get back on track back then. It was like, Hey, you know, I'm staying at the same hotel and Danny Brower's a friend of mine and Shirley and Danny or, or Shirley and Sherry are 
eating lunch together. And, you know, we took you a few guys would talk and there's, you know, the no information rule was way different and, and all those things. So there wasn't, um, there, there wasn't all that, that out there. And I, now obviously the world is very different. You know, I mean, the, the first day of an event now, you, if you've got something kind of different or unique, it isn't long for the rest of the field and the rest of the world and all the fans to know exactly what's going on. I mean, especially with live, you can't hide anything anymore. There's no, there's no secret baits, no secret techniques, no, uh, I mean, a, heck a classic example of that for 25 years, I've been throwing a jerk bait year round catching bass when Bassmaster live started, uh, you know, and it's not been that long ago. I mean, it's crazy to think how far the sports come yeah. in a few years, but you know, it showed the world. I remember that tournament at Ross Barnett that I was catching them jerking the ditches in the lily pads with a jerk bait in muddy water that just, it just blew people away, you know? And, and now with uh, forward facing sonar with mega live, I mean, uh, a jerk bait is just one of the best tools there is for, for mega live. Right. And so everybody's throwing a jerk bait year round. And I mean, for 25 years, I had it to myself. Yeah. And so you just don't, they don't miss anything anymore. And they're, um, guys are really quick to make adjustments. And again, um, you can't jump out to a big lead like you could in a four day straight competition, like the elite series is in, in our format where, I mean, we fish two days uh, of qualifying. Then we go back to zero fish, the knockout round against the best, the best top 40 guys at the time in a two day shootout, you know? So, uh, that was super evident at, at Cayuga. I mean, the first day of the tournament, only seven guys were fishing the south end of the lake and we all blasted them. You know, the smallmouth were spawning down there. I had 28 pounds or something like that. The next day, the whole field's down there and they didn't, they weren't, they didn't find them down there and that. And just, you know, it's again through social media and looking at the website and things like that. It's, uh, you know, and that's the, that's the world we live in now today. It's nothing, I didn't say there's something wrong with it. It's just, that's how it is. So it's hard to get, a big jump on anybody anymore. You know, you can't save a magic spot for the last day because people don't miss anything. Our electronics are so good. Uh, people are putting the work in, they're pre-fishing, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're learning, uh, you know, our, our technology is at Google Earth and, and uh, it, it, people just work differently at it, you know, there, you know, on those rainy, nasty blow days back in the, in the early nineties, man, there'd be a bunch of guys that never leave the motel on a practice day. There's not a guy out there on the Bass Pro Tour or on the Elite Series that isn't dark to dark in practice because you have to, that's how competitive it is. And if you don't do that, you're being, you know, you're being left behind. And, uh, you know, as much, uh, it, I love the competition and I'm sure you know, I'm, it's going to be hard when the Bass Pro Tour starts up next year and, and I'm not there. I, fortunately, you know, I've got a couple of tournaments that I'm qualified for through this year. So I've, I don't got to go cold turkey. But when you're um, used to doing that for so long, like, like I am, I'm trained to do that. And I'm uh, trained to do that every day and dart to practice and go about it. It's going to be it's going to be a change. So. For me, as long as I've done this, I mean, 33 years, full-time professional and you know, a good bit longer than that, I'm amazed at how much that I still learn every single day out there. It, it's mind boggling to me through this season. You know, I've fished the semi chain a jillion times. Gunnersville, how many turn? I've fished as many tournaments on Gunnersville as about there is any place. Murray, you know, I mean, just St. Clair. And I'm just, how much that I still learn every time out there on the water and that's one thing that I don't want to give up, you know, in, in my future endeavors, I still want to be traveling around, going to the best fisheries at the best times and, um, and being out there. But thankfully I'll get to do it without, you know, 80 or a hundred of, <laughs> you know, competitors all, all around, you know, I'll be able to kind of pick those times and, and maybe pick a little better in that process. You know I mean? It's, uh, it, it's been such a, amazing journey though no doubt i mean i'm just so thankful for all the great times that i've had and uh you know so many people that i've met that that's the hardest part is going to be not being around my fellow competitors and the tournament staff and uh you know the media people that you're just used to seeing all the time you know i mean the relationships that 
that you form. I mean, you look at uh, Alan McGuckin, for example. Yeah. I've, I've known Guck for, you know, 25 years, as long as he's been in the, in the sport. I officiated his wedding this year, you know, I mean, um, and I'm just so used to him being around at the events and, and it's on and on. I mean, uh, you know, so many years at Bass with, with Trip Weldon and, you know, before that Dewey Kendrick and originally Ray Scott and, uh, and all the JM crew, you know, with, with Miami Sanders and, you know, I mean, obviously Zona, you, I mean, Davey, my roommate forever. It's just, those are the, those are the, the relationships that are, they're going to be the toughest, you know I mean? Yeah. You still, I still got to go to ICAST and, you know, be at the classic expo and things like that. And you'll see some people here and there, but it's not the same as when you, it's second family, you know, yeah. it's your second family. And that part, uh, it, I'm definitely going to miss and it's going to, you know, it's going to be a challenge, but I promise you this, when we, when my family and I do get together, we will make the most of it. <laughs> Giddy up. You know, <laughs> I do know that the, the Randall Tharp story was very cool. I mean, to, to have you tell it uh, on live and to, to have you tell it several times since. But are we reaching a time where you almost could say somebody like Randall Tharp making a classy move like that in some ways puts him at a disadvantage? No, there's no question. But Randall's the kind of guy that knows that you know, that respect would be returned. You yeah. know, him and I have fished around each other an awful lot the last couple of years. Like we talk about it, you know, we've become pretty good friends and, you know, there's not anybody that I'd rather have around me because, you know, I mean, we fished a tournament at Lake Fork and we shared the back of this Creek and, you know, we kind of you pick your areas and you just, it's an unwritten, there's unwritten rules yeah. for, for some. And there's, it's not that way for others. It's like Mark Trax Jr. is a good buddy of mine, NASCAR, you know, I mean, he's a championship NASCAR driver and uh, man, he's having a heck of a year again this year. And we've talked a lot about it. I mean, I, cause I'm a race fan and I'll say, you know, I'll talk to him about hey, and this past race and, you know, so-and-so was around here. He bumped here. He knocked, you know, and he's not the kind of guy that'll, bump somebody out of the way on the last lap to, to steal in. He's going to, if he can't get around you, the, the old school, hard earn it racing way, he's just not going to do it. And, but people that do it to him, you know, he's going to do it back. So he's, you know, I'm going to race you the way you're going to race me. And that's the way that I've looked at it. And I think um, with, and it's, I think it's across all the leagues right now, there's um, a difference in, in the way people look at things and do yeah. things and etiquette on the water. And hopefully, cause I've had a lot of anglers reach out to me in the, in the last month since Cayuga for sure. Right. Uh, a lot of guys on our tour, on the elite series, a lot of guys that, that don't fish either of them that, you know, even fish below that asking questions and, and doing things. And I think because it doesn't seem that the leagues have the ability to, police those gray area unwritten rules very well and the etiquette and sportsmanship on the water it comes out and you know it, it just you know you get on a ledge tournament and get a bunch of guys around each other at Gunnersville or Pickwick or Kentucky Lake there you know there's some things that come out that aren't positive you know for sure and that you know whether it is people are competitive and i and i get it and everybody has their own side of the story but hopefully through all this there'll be some good that comes out of it but in the end to me and i've told a lot of guys this it's up to it's going to be up to the anglers to set the standard of what they think sportsmanship and etiquette on the water um it's not up to the league you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's rules, certain rules in place, right, that we all want to follow. And that's all I've, I've ever wanted is a level playing field. And trust me, I have been, I've lost a lot of tournaments over the years from guys that have gotten local help, not against the rules, but gotten information, you know, before the off limits or, you know, be, back in the day before you could get wave points, whatever it was. I've, I've been beat by that many, many times. You know, I've always... I don't fish like other people. That's not the way that I do it. Um, it's very obvious the guys 
who do or who did, especially back in the day, because they're they were so inconsistent. There's no yeah. consistency in in getting help, right? If you can't do it on your own. And I thought it was really obvious and telling when we started the Major League Fishing Cup series, where you show up, uh, you don't even know where you're at. They can't you can't do any research or anything like that to see which you know which anglers excelled in that format. It's it's, it's very telling who's 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 a quick study on the water and, and a very instinctual fisherman, right? So um, that being said, like I say, hopefully uh, the anglers as a as a whole take it into their own hands and 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 set the standards because there's a whole group of young anglers coming up uh high school anglers college anglers that are that are coming up that uh maybe not have came up the same way that a lot of guys did learning it all on their own you know learning everything they you know had you know mentors or people taking them out showing them spots on lakes taking them you know they go to uh, i've had a million people ask me for Hey, can I have some uh, waypoints on Kentucky Lake or Gunnersville or college tournament or whatever? And that's not the way um, that you learn, you know. And uh, you know, I've, I've watched uh, the Robinson boys come up. I mean, I see their passion, and Great it's pretty story. exciting to watch to watch Marshall, uh, you know, earn his way to the Bass Pro Tour and Mitchell to win the high school national championship, all like a week apart. You know, I mean, because yeah. those boys they live it, breathe it, love it. Uh, do it every day and put the work and effort to go figure it out, you know, on their own or new techniques or uh, what, whatever it is. And, and I, you know, those boys will be a force in the, in the future, you know, and that's, that's the kids that you see coming up. I think a lot of them have, you know, put that kind of effort and work into it. So, but yeah, I, you know, we all want, you know, rainbow and rainbows and unicorns, for the future of the sport, but it's, it's really going to be, I think it's going to be up to the anglers themselves to, to really set the standards and not tolerate any of this monkey business and, uh, you know, things that have, that have been happening that, I, that I've seen. It's, it's not good for the sport. It's, it's not, it's, it's not good for, for anything long-term it, you know, to be a professional angler is something special. It's not, uh, it's not a right. It's something that you have to earn and it, it deserves a lot of respect. Uh, you know, if, if you, if you want to have, a, you know, a lengthy career in this sport, there's only one way to go about it in my, in my opinion, but, uh, it's, it's not all about success on the water, you, you know, to be a professional angler, you know, a big part of it is what you do, how you compete, a very large part of it, or one of the most important parts is how you are off the water, how you handle yourself, um, your brand, your image, um, your relationships with sponsors and companies, because the whole world, you know, the whole industry is, is looking at it. And, you know, it, if you want to be successful, you have to try to focus on all of it. I, I think, I believe. Yeah. And, and I think the Robinson story is, an incredible story because I mean, I saw that in those kids fishing your pond. I saw that yep. countless times where like takeoff finishes and it's literally me and the wives and bass tournament staff walking up the dock. Cause all you guys are gone and they're fishing, they're fishing the off limits. Like it's yeah. ultimately, I think for long-term success, you have to have that. Like you definitely have that, you know, you've always had that, yeah. but like, if there's water, you're fishing. Like you have to have, and you you can't steal your way to that. There's nobody to get that from. You need to have that. Yeah, you you're 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 born with it. I think um, that just instinctual, natural passion, love for you know, where even on those nasty days, it's like, man, I've I've I you want to be out there. You got to be out there and uh, and and do it and it. It just, to me, it's never got old. I, I've loved it. You know, later in my career, I, I've got, you know, a lot of demands on my time, a lot of obligations and things like that. So, I mean, I really look forward to the tournaments, to time. On, I mean, it's it's fun. You know, I mean, I don't care if the weather's bad. I, I would love practice. I want to be out there to, to, to figure it out and, uh, you know, 
that's always been the thrill for me is not catching the fish, but I mean, I'm, uh, there's millions of people that love bass fishing, but yeah. there's a separate group that's that got that tournament angler mindset that loves that competitive act, aspect. And um, yeah, I've had so many guys come up to me, other competitors and go, man, I can't believe, I can't believe that you're, you're going to retire, that you're uh-huh. going to give it up, that you're, because we're not built that way. You know, we're not designed uh, that way. It's, it's imprinted into us that competitive nature and drive motivation to put the work and time in uh, as a tournament angler. So it's such a different thing where, you know, there's so many people that it's like, man, I want to go out on this weekend and just relax and, and, you know, catch some catch bass, you know, they just do it for a totally different reason, but which is great. But uh, you know, I feel good about my, you know, about the whole decision. Um, I think in my next phase of my career, I'm going to be very competitive, but just in a different way. You know, I mean, when you're out there trying to get the best content, film a show, do whatever, you know, uh, film a video for a sponsor and you, you got to catch fish for it and you need a big one or, you know, that's still that competitive drive. You know I mean? It's still similar in the same way. I mean, weekend anglers and tournament anglers are a lot alike in a lot of ways. I mean, you got a limited amount of time. You got to go out there and make it happen quick. And we all want to be successful. So, I mean, if you got six hours to fish on Saturday before you got to mow your lawn uh, as a weekend angler, and I've got, you know, six hours to to fish a tournament, I don't want to spend my time out there just casting on a min, right? And that's the, that's the, the same mentality there. So, um, you know, and I love that. I love the teaching aspect of it. So I'm going to have a lot of fun. And I've been doing, you know, a lot of television shows and, and videos and things for years and years and years. So this next phase, uh, you know, I'll just be doing more of the same things that I love. One of the things you, you said, and I do want to move on from this after this, but you keep, you said it's up to the anglers to make yeah. it better. It's up to the anglers to, to yeah. play. How, how do the anglers... The anglers of tomorrow, how do they make it better? Well, I think um, it has to start at the top level because I believe that, you know, the Elite Series and the Bass Pro Tour, I mean, those are the two top tours, top tiers in professional fishing out there. Um, That group, what they want their league to be and and how they uh, league to be viewed and again, I've told a lot of those guys and, and I, you know, I'm in all those meetings uh, where I'm at every meeting there. Um, you know, we go over the rules, we talk about these things. And so, uh, you know, I guess I was a little bit naive to think that things would be different than they were, but we've, we've all seen it, you know, m- multiple times, uh, that it's not, or that it hasn't been. And I just, I just think that, you just, you, you can't tolerate no for an answer. If somebody says, well, Hey, we want to have, we, you know, we want to have a a level of sportsmanship, but you're going to always have, you're going to have guys that have differences on the water, you know, Oh, I'm in this area or, or, you know, you weren't here the day before or or whatever. You're always, you're always going to, going to have some of that, but the sportsmanship, Um, you know, having a set of rules that we have a level playing field on, you know, to where we're all competing with the, with the same uh, standards in mind, you know, I just, I just think that maybe I'm wrong, but I just, I think that the only way to uphold that is through the angler group. And I've seen a lot of that. uh, I've seen a lot of that come out in the Bass Pro Tour. You know, where guys are just like, hey, it's, you know, better. We're, we're not going to, we're not going to do it this way. And, you know, I, I just hope, I, you know, I just hope for the future that they, they take that initiative. I want to be, you know, I want to be in, involved. I mean, I'm not like, I'm not walking away from this. I've always tried to be since day one at Bass Angler Advisory Board. And I, I'm going to tell you in the early days, um, you know, I think Helen and Ray just humored us a lot by, by doing that. Um, the reality of it is, is anglers as a group don't have the ability 
or the understanding to make business decisions, things that affect business for the leagues. The leagues have to, um, you know, bass has to make money. Major League Fishing has to make money as a league to be able to um, support these events. I mean, anglers are always, oh, we want more payouts. We want smaller entry fees. And I agree, you know, we've been fishing for a hundred thousand dollar purse for a really long time. It hasn't changed in a really long time. And uh, the sponsorship model um, has gone up and down, but you know, in the last handful of years, I mean, COVID hit and that was a big setback. If you're in the event business, that's, you know, in the industry and now we're, you know, I mean, it, it kind of goes up and down, but uh, that business model is, you know, if, if you're the one that wrote the check to, to to buy bass or to own major league fishing, you sure don't want anglers making decisions to run your business. I don't I don't want somebody else making decisions to run my business. But um, there's nobody that knows tournament fishing better than than the angler group. And they should definitely be involved in in the standards, the rules, um, you know, the playing field, the the locations, the timing. I mean, it's in the end, we all want to work together to make the the best events out there, to have the best tournaments. You know, I mean, there's not one angler out there or one person at Bass or Major League Fishing that doesn't want to show up, have a tournament in a great community support where the fishing's great and we're catching, you know, lots of big ones and and really being able to showcase that fishery in that area and the people in that area. That's the that's what we're all trying to do. And the timing of that is obviously important. You know, I mean, you can look at the schedule and say, man, I want to be at Santee Cooper in the second week of March. There's a full moon right then. And then you get an ice storm from Mother Nature and, and it throws it off. But I mean, when you're trying to schedule and plan things out, that's a that's kind of how you look at it. But beyond that, on high level decisions and, uh, you know, what networks you work with, what what made, you know, the the title sponsors and things like that. I mean, the league has to obviously keep control over that. So there's a place for both, but on the on the rule side and the sports questionable uh, rule, you know, uh, whether it's about no information or off limits or um, site fishing or whatever it is, uh, they know how it's how it's written and the biggest thing there is everybody has to understand the intent of of what we're trying to police against i mean we can literally as a licensed angler in, in any state i can literally kill whatever yeah. the legal limit is every day well nobody wants to do that we want to take care of those fish um the best we can you know and that's why you know we don't want to you know we're not we're not fishing to lead a bend in in August, you know, because it's it's very hard for fish care in a place like that, right? And it's a good time. Uh, you know, they're not making more lakes. They're we're not getting more habitat. Uh, obviously, we've got a lot of great stories, conservation stories out there. We're you know, I'm trying to do a lot to help with habitat improvement and stocking of of some of these things. I mean, it, the future of these fisheries and the sport is really really important to me. And we all have to work together with that. And the anglers have the best platforms and voice to showcase that. So that is, those are all things that we have to look at and we have to work collectively as a group to do. I mean, there's just, um, I, the hardest thing for me in my career is on being all on all these boards and in all these meetings and angler advisory groups and just tournament briefings in general is, dealing with all the personal agendas and, and selfishness. And I get it because, you know, 80 independent business people that are there plus yeah. the lead and, you know, in the elite series, you know, I don't know how many guys you got, but everybody's got their own business and you have to do what's good for your own. I mean, you have to, it's human nature to, to think that way. But in the end, I've always, I've really tried hard to put my personal that you know views aside and try to look at the big picture and make decisions based on what I think is best for the sport and best for the league you know they they if the league is not successful you're not going to have a great tournament series you know so I've always tried to do that I've did it for you know I've worked so hard over the years 
um, when I'm with Bass to, to help them uh, with relationships with communities and states and things like that to to bring tournaments there, whatever it is at any level to, uh, you know, work with media, whatever, whatever it is, I'm always trying to do that. And, you know, when the whole, uh, you know, Major League Fishing Bass split came down, you know, I, I did it because I thought it was going to be what was going to, what the sport needed, what was going to be best for the sport for the future. And it's, it's been a challenge because, not everybody's views are that way. You know, you, you, you have, you're always going to have some of that out there, but um, in the end, there's a, a really good group of anglers, uh, professional anglers across all the leagues out there. I mean, not just bass, not just MLF that do care about conservation and yeah. the future of the sport and the, the health of these fisheries and, and that the major, uh, you know, the vast majority do, but unfortunately, Every now and then there's, you know, some of these things that come up that that are not positive and we have to, you know, we have to work. Amen. I mean, you, you got to, I mean, the, the greatest caretakers of the outdoors has always been outdoors people, whether it's hunting, yeah. fishing. I mean, they're, they're, if there's no hunting, all these great animals are not on the face of the earth anymore. Yeah. If there is, you know, I know it seems like, oh yeah, just there's groups that think you can the people that take care of fish, the people that take care of the wildlife is the people that are outdoors people. So yeah. um, it, it has to be taken care of. But one thing stood out to me earlier when you said it, because you were talking about going to Canada and it wasn't open and you had to drive around and just, you know, graph. And, and you said it drove you crazy. You were bored out of your mind. Mm. We hear all these hero stories about anglers spending their whole day, just seat time, just looking for that nugget through your career. Have you done a lot of that or have you, or do you generally have to have oh, yeah. your foot on the trolling motor? No. So yeah, I've done tons of it. The pro the challenge is, is Lake St. Clair. It's, it's, it's hard there because it's just so, I mean, there's not a lot of structure. There's not a lot of contour. Um, yeah. There's, you know, miles of cabbage flat there's miles of sand grass and it's it's all so much the same you know yeah. so it's the boringest place in the world to graph <laughs> kentucky lake is my favorite place you know there's 70 miles of ledges there and i mean i have spent so much time there side imaging uh on those ledges there, looking for that gold mine and yeah. i found it a, a bunch of times like man some of the greatest schools of bass that I've found in my career have been on that lake right there. And there's nothing funner uh, and thrown out there and just lighten them up every cast. Yeah, I mean, I did it at Saginaw Bay last week. I mean, you just, you, when you hit them, they, it was, it's just game day, you know I mean? And, and Kentucky lakes that way, Pickwick, the Tennessee river in general, but just about, you know, anywhere, uh, the Coosa river, I've done it lots. I mean, you can do it at, at Lanier, you know, that's why you spend the time with your electronics is looking for that needle in the, in the hay field out there, that magic spot that um, you can just, you know, change the world on. As a tournament angler, that's what you have to hunt. And, you know, with Lake Master mapping being so good, um, it's so hard to do, but I mean, for years, that's, I mean, the most valuable tool that I had, you know, in, in that, you know, when I'm one of a lot of angler years and classics and that was Lake Master Mapping. I mean, it's, as you know, it's, it's so superior now. I mean, there's other things that have come close, but Lake Master Mapping is still, uh, it's just an unbelievable tool, you know, with being able to highlight depth zones to help you see big picture about areas to be able to, uh, adjust for the for the water levels um and then just the detail that it has you know I, in a lot of cases i would take lake master mapping over side imaging you know i mean it just it's that good when it, the tournament i won at toledo bend one thousand percent why i won that tournament was lake master mapping you know they had had really added to the map it's a huge lake they'd really added to the south end of the lake um that year just prior to it. And I mean, I didn't even, I'd literally pull up to the, what I tournament 
and fire a 10 XD out there without even looking at my depth finder. And not even stopping at seeing, hey, it's 29 foot or 28 feet, but just seeing these little areas where the contour lines had some irregularities to it, you know, structurally or something special like that, that you just pull up there. I mean, blind. I mean, I was fortunate the first day of that tournament to catch a good bag on the shad spawn. And I mean, I just went practicing and caught like 28 or 29 pounds just because of the late master mapping. So, you know, uh, I, I, so thankful to get to compete through to me was, you know, some, some of the best eras in the sport. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, now there's forward facing sonar and that that's, you know, really taken over the spotlight and, and a lot of people's views is, you know, mega live and, uh, you know, just live, live sonar in general, yeah. but Mega 360 came out it's such a game changer. You know, when yeah. side imaging came out, it was amazing. You know, it just made you so much more efficient. Late master mapping. I mean, I, you know, when I started my first, my first graph was, a you know, best graph was a hummingbird super 30. You know, I mean, it's gosh, you know, that's all we had. And we didn't no GPS. We had, you know, Loran C was before GPS and it wouldn't even put you within two football fields, you know, so, you know, we were triangulating off of a tower in the side of a house and a corner of a bridge, you know, and God forbid you're out in the middle of Lake St. Clair because you, you'd you never find a, a spot again, you know. But so, you know, I've lived through all those areas, fished through through all of them and uh, technologies to this Crazy. day. Yeah, yeah, but it's the greatest, uh, imp- it's the greatest thing to help the difference in, in industry and you know people talk about the good old days and it's a testament to all the anglers out there um because these are the, the the fish you know bass fishing nationally is the best it's ever been i yeah. mean you look you look around i mean obviously the great lakes are different we got zebra mussels and gobies and things that's changed it up here but we're catching more and bigger ones than ever but but anywhere even in the south um you know with with the added pressure and and all of that i mean the the mindfulness of catch and release conservation um you know biology management bio, you know how they're regulating a lot of these fisheries and things like that putting special regulations at places like lake fork i mean what an amazing fishery you know i yeah. mean i don't know that there's any place in the south that you can go and have an opportunity to catch more world class largemouth than lake fork i mean it's it gets a ton of pressure and it's still one of the best trophy bass lakes there is you know so that's just a testament to not just the biologists but the anglers that are using the resources i know you've got a lot going on so i don't want to keep you much longer dude because uh, this retirement thing doesn't seem to be very relaxing (laughs) for you so far uh you're very very busy but if you had to take like one adjective or one thought like why did kevin van dam become kvd and i don't i mean the great Tim Tucker obviously is the person who gave you that name. But the reason I'm saying is what, I mean, dude, I say it to you all the time, just to, with everything you've accomplished, how, like, well, why, why you? Man, I don't know. I just, <laughs> I've just always loved what I do. I just, I mean, I've just always pushed myself out of bed in the morning, go out and practice or to compete. Um, I just, I love the competition. I love, uh, you know, I love the people and it's just, it's just what I've always had a passion for. And even when I'm not competing or I'm not fishing a tournament, man, I love going out there and, and dialing it in and dialing them up, you know, and it's, it's just something special. Just like we were talking about when you find one of those mega schools and you just, just hit them, you know, we were at Saginaw Bay um, and it was the second qualifying day. And I knew that I'd have to maybe find some uh, some largemouth or check some of the largemouth areas for a backup, you know, go for the knockout round if the wind blew or something, you know, something changed if those if I couldn't five other guys on on the area that I was fishing. Um, so I rolled down through some through some stuff uh, that I was fishing. I caught a few, and I happened to be um, just driving around 30 mile an hour looking, you know, I got, uh, you know, I got a new pair at ICAST. I got a new pair of Costa King tides from one of the engineers there in sunrise. Okay. Sunrise silver. That's to me, the best lenses there are for 
northern fish and especially sight fish and things like that. And, uh, you know, they came out with them there. It's an amazing pair of glasses, great technology. And, and they come in blue mirror, which is, you know, it's a great open water lens. But to see grass, weed clumps, rock piles, things like that, you know, in the shallow flats, you, I want something that's like x-ray vision, right? And that's what Sunrise Silver is to me. So I'm just, I'm tooling, I'm just kind of zigzagging these flats looking for grass clumps. And I seen a dark lot that I went by at about 100 yards and I wheeled around. And, uh, and I, and I pulled up to it and it's only in like six foot of water, but it's two miles offshore. It's way out there. And the water level at Saginaw Bay is real low to begin with. And so I, I put down my Raptors as I eased up to it. Cause I knew that this could be, uh, it, it could be something really unique. And this is in that knockout round or not, or in the qualifying round. So, I mean, I've already got, you know, whatever 20 pounds i'm in in the lead i've locked into you know we're going to weights are going to zero i don't need to catch another bass but i pulled up to this i picked up my thunder cricket off the deck and i fired it out there to it and landed on top of this dark spot and as my bait hit the water one met it out coming out of the water to eat it and i'm like oh my gosh and i just could not this is how much i love it I couldn't help myself. I just get, I think I caught, I just kept throwing. They weren't big ones. They were two and a half pounders, but I'm like, man, this is what I live for. I love doing this. This is, I love catching them like this. You know I mean? I like finding them, but I also like catching them like that. So, I mean, I knew it was my last term and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm not going to waste this opportunity. I'm going to enjoy every second of this. And I did, I, I throttled them till I couldn't get another bite there. And in the championship day, I had to go back down there and, and I caught a bunch off of it, but a bunch of those two and a half pounders were gone. So, you know, <laughs> I might've hurt myself a little bit, but, you know, and so many times in the past as a competitor, you know, I'll pull up and make a flip with the hook bent over, or you catch one and there's 20 of them there and you just, I, I'm not going to make another cast, you know, but in that last tournament, I said, no, nope, it's time to have some fun. That, that tells you. How much I love it. You definitely love it. And uh man, you you've you're such a huge part of this sport, dude. Um, and I you know, I say it to you all the time, I'm thankful for everything you've done for me and my family personally, but most of all, I'm proud to call you my friend. I'm proud of uh, of the amazing career that you've had, and um I'm looking forward to seeing what's next and what happens ahead for you. I know um I know we have maybe a little, we're going to have a little, I don't know if it's officially that, but I'll say make it right now. We're going to, in next month, we're all going to get together and have a little unofficial KVD bomb voyage party. I mean, <laughs> um, but uh, dude, all I can say is thank you for everything you've done for the sport. Um, you know, I, I know people say quite often in press conferences and stuff when they retire that I just want to walk away from the sport leaving it better and dude everything that you've done you can't you know you can't say that you haven't made this sport better and I, and i and i thank you for all of that well i truly appreciate it you know it's it's been an honor it's been humbling but i'm far from done you know i definitely have uh, a, a real passion for it i have a real passion for conservation um and making a difference. You know, Johnny Morris is a great mentor to me. I've seen a lot of the things that he's done, the impact that, you know, we can all make. Um, you know, I'm fortunate that um, I've got a platform and a voice that, you know, allows me to almost be a, a megaphone and magnify, you know, some of these, maybe some problems, some issues, uh, some, but also some, some great opportunities to make a difference, you know, for the future. And, and I've got, you know, uh, younger boys and, and you do too. And we are all, I want the next generation to have the same opportunities that, that I've had and in working hard, uh, to improve the sport, to make it better and, and to ensure the future of it. So, uh, and I look forward to, you know, we're gonna be at the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame. Um, man, you're, you, you say about me, but I mean, you give your time every year to host that, um, and it, it's a great, it's a great event. It's a, it's a great night. Um, Mike Iconelli is going to be inducted this year. And I kind of, he's my, uh, he's my underling, so to speak. I took him kind of under the wing to do it. So they've got a, 
a uh, huge contingent of people coming to it. I know he's super excited about it. And yeah, and then we're going to go to down to Big Cedar for a few days and uh, get to relax. And, and that's a that's a great thing that I want to have the opportunity to do in my retirement um, is to be able to do some of these other fun trips as well, you know, and to mix it in with work and and that and not have the the set schedule that the tour has. That That's the hardest part. I mean, that's probably the biggest reason for this change in, in my, uh, you know, work plan, so to speak, is just that set rigorous schedule that the tour is. I've done it for 33 years and missed a lot. My family sacrificed a lot. And, and I'm just really looking forward to having the opportunities to do some of these other special things um, and, and to be able to be more impactful in a lot more ways than just as a tournament angler. So, you know, tournaments have built who I am for sure. But uh, in this next phase, you know, I, I, I plan to really make an impact uh, on, on the largest scale that I can. You know, I'm fortunate to be able to meet and know a lot of people uh, around the country and the world and the industry uh, that, you know, that we can influence and, and uh, again, ensure uh, for future anglers, for, for the, the Marshall Robinsons and the Mitchell Robinsons and a lot of these, uh, you know, all those high school kids that are, that are uh, aspiring, you know, to move up that ladder like that for that next generation. So uh, I want to be there for them. Well, I look forward to watching. I'm not even going to bug you with what exactly you're doing, but I just make him. I mean, you come back here every few months, it seems. So uh, we will get an update <laughs> on, on what you're, what you're doing in the future. Correct. Yeah, I will definitely, um, um, you know, like you say, you, you, I'm going to be very visible. I, I love, uh, you know, I've got a great group of partners that I've uh, worked with for a lot of years. It's something I'm super proud of is the relationships that I have with the companies um, that you know, are so long. I mean, Bass Pro Shops, my whole career, Nitro Boats, you know, my whole career, um, you know, Strike King, uh, you know, just must add great partners uh, and, and a lot of new ones too. You know I mean? So it's exciting. You know, I know they're looking forward to the opportunity to have more time um, to be able to utilize me to, uh, you know, I'll be doing probably a lot more commercials and filming and things like that, but I still want to spend a lot of time on the water. And, and I love teaching people. One of the, you know, one of the most gratifying things to me is the stories I get about people that come back and say, man, I, I watched this show that you did, um, you know, on this technique or with this bait, or I seen this video, or I, uh, you know, seen it on your YouTube channel. And man, I went out and you know, I had the greatest day ever. My dad caught the biggest fish or uh, I took my daughter and she caught her first fish, whatever it is. I mean, those are um, to help people be more successful in their ventures on the water, whether they're, you know, fishing in a tournament or off the bank or in a kayak or, um, you know, I always want to be there to, to try to help people have a better day, you know, to have a more positive experience because fishing is to me, it's very unique to a lot of things. Um, you know, you don't have to have any special attributes. You don't have to have um, a, a boat like, I, you know, a Z21 Nitro with five hummingbirds on it and Mega 360 and Mega Live to be, it, it all helps. But, you know, you can you can just fish from the bank or a kayak or canoe or, um, you know, with a Zepco 33 like I started with and, and, and have a great time. And whatever level you want to take it at, um, there's always more to learn. I've been doing it my whole career and I'm still learning. So uh, I look forward to a whole lot more of that. As do I, and as to millions of bass fishing fans around the world, the greatest to ever play the game, the goat, whatever you want to call him. There he is. Kevin Van Dam. There you have it. The one and only Kevin Van Dam. I could listen to that dude talk for days. Um, and, and I thank him. Thank him for saving this week's show and i'd like you guys i mean he's got some good stuff coming trust me there is some big things happening because kevin van dam um i mean he just doesn't know how to slow down he may have been removing himself from tournaments retiring from tournaments but there's a lot still to see but i'd like you guys to do me a favor and i will put the link in the description and in the comments down below 
get over to KVD's YouTube channel and give him a subscription. Follow there because uh, he'll be making some announcements here in the not too distant future, I am sure. So you want to be part of that. And I thank him once again for saving this week's show. And I thank all of you guys for tuning in week after week. Whether you're listening on YouTube or one of the streaming platforms, you guys are freaking awesome. I cannot thank you enough. The way this show grows week in, week out is because of one reason. And that is you guys. Because you tune in week after week. And I thank you for that. And we'll be back next week with all sorts of chat about, of course, Progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year, Dakota Lithium Rookie of the Year. Uh, our two Bassmaster winners from the last two events. Congrats to whoever won on Champlain. I'm sure it was awesome. We'll talk about all that next week when I get back in your life. Until then, enjoy being, have a great week, and Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?